Lord, thank you again for giving us your game plan, revelation of Jesus Christ. Amen. Now give us ears to hear what the Spirit has to say to all the churches. In Jesus' name we say, Amen. Amen. So last week, if you remember, there was an outline. It's found in Revelation chapter 1, verse 19. It's three divisions. Let me read it to you. Therefore, write the things which you have seen. That's chapter 1 of Jesus Christ in his glorified state, holding the, the seven candlesticks to churches. Write these things that you have seen. That's chapter 1. And then in chapter 2 and 3, he says, and the things which, will, and the things which are, that's the seven churches he's speaking to, but I want you to understand that seven is symbolic. It's to all the churches for all the ages. But he was particularly speaking to these seven literal churches as well. And then he says, and then, uh, and bring, okay, I'm sorry. Which, the things which are, that's the seven churches. And the things which will take place after these things, after what things? After this, him writing down what he's seen about Jesus in chapter one, and then chapter two and three, which is the church age. So write down these things. After these things, it says in Revelation 4, verse 1, that he was taken up. And you don't hear of the church from then on in until chapter 19 when Christ comes back with his saints and with the angels. So during that time, from 4 to chapter 19 is the tribulation, the seven-year tribulation. And during that tribulation, you have seven seals, you have seven trumpets, you have seven bowls. Each one gets more worse and worse and worse. So 777 is written maybe 54 times in the book of Revelation. So it's symbolic as well as literal. The number of God, seven, is completeness. And you'll see that as we teach it. The number of man is what? Six. Six, 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 six the Antichrist. So in symbolism, number six is man. Number seven is God's completeness, his perfection. So... Let's read verses 4 and 5. We'll start there, and we're going to read not through, but we're going to end at verse 11. So in verse 4, John to the seven churches that are in Asia, that's Turkey, grace and peace to you. Now notice here, you'll see the Trinity. Grace and peace from him who is and was and who is to come, the Father, from the seven spirits, that's the Holy Spirit, and I'll explain to you in a minute about the seven, who are before us, before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness. So the Trinity is part of fulfilling God's plan of redemption. The Father sent the Son, the Son came, the Son sent the Holy Spirit, so it's all working together. It's one God, it's a Trinity, it's not three separate persons, but yet there's three different parts of God. How's that? Water, ice, and vapor. It's all the same substance. It's water. The Trinity, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, it's all the same substance. It's God. So let's talk about the seven spirits. You mean God has seven spirits? No. In chapter 5 of Revelation, verse 6, I'll read it. You can write it. And I saw between the throne with the four living creatures and the elders a lamb standing as if slain. So you have the throne of God the Father. You have the elders on the other side, and in the middle you have the Lamb of God standing as if slain. Now think about it. When you get to heaven, is you going to see a Lamb uh, slain? No, it's symbolic to Jesus Christ, who was the Lamb of God that was slain for our sins. So it says here, between the elders and the throne, a Lamb uh, standing as if slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits. So we just read the seven spirits who are before us in verse 4 of Revelation 1. So here we have the seven eyes and seven horns, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. So horns in the Bible always represents power. So here you have the, omnis uh, the omnipotence of God, the seven horns of the spirit is the seven powers of the Holy Spirit. The seven eyes is his omniscience. Seven is the completeness, remember. He is complete in seeing everything. Nothing you can hide from God. And he's sent out into the world. So remember the number seven is completeness, fullness. Some have said from Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2, that it's the sevenfold ministry of the Holy Spirit, which is, which is this. When it says the Spirit of the Lord will fall upon Jesus, 
the spirit of the love of God rest on him, the spirit of wisdom two, the spirit of understanding three, the spirit of counsel four, the spirit of strength five, the spirit of knowledge six, and the fear of the Lord seven. So you could read into that and say, okay, this is the sevenfold ministry of the Holy Spirit that fell upon Jesus. But just for moving along, I just wanted to clarify that, that there isn't seven eyes on the Holy Spirit or the seven horns, and he's not standing like a lamb slain. It's all symbolism of the omnipotence and of the omniscience of God and the Lamb of God, which is Jesus Christ that was slain. Now, in verse 5, I want to read to you. He says he's the firstborn from the dead. So was Jesus the first that was ever raised from the dead? Of course not. So there must be something to this, the firstborn. We know Lazarus rose from the dead and many others. So it says here, the firstborn of the dead, speaking of Jesus, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us, and released us, some other versions say washed us, it's all saying the same thing, from our sins by his blood. You're released from your sins, you're washed from your sins, how? By his blood, by accepting Jesus Christ. So what does it mean by saying he's the firstborn of the dead? He's the firstborn of this new creation. Keep in mind, he was God in heaven always. And the Word became flesh, meaning he wasn't man and God in heaven. It was Jesus Christ God. But when he came to earth, it says, and God became flesh. He took on the human life, the human spirit. So he was man 100%, and he was God 100%. So he is the firstborn of this new creation, meaning this. When he rose from the dead... He was the new creation of the God-man that we're going to be. Man. Glorified man in God. God and man one. When we see him, we'll be like him. We're not going to be other. We're going to follow him. He was the first. He has to be the first. Yeah. You can't be the first to be the God-man. He has to be the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. So when it says here that he's the firstborn of the dead and then we're going to follow the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and released us. Colossians 1.18 says the seven, says the 17, says the same thing. It says, he is also the head of the body, the church, and he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. Firstborn from the dead. In Hebrews, it tells us that we belong to the church of the firstborn. The church of the firstborn is Jesus Christ. He's the firstborn, and you belong to him. So now you're, you're, you're born. So when you accepted Christ as a man, you became now part of God. You see? And that part of God is being developed in you more and more. And so when we get to heaven, when we see him, we'll be like him. What was he like when he rose from the dead? He was 100% God, 100% man, man. He was glorified. And you'll be glorified with his image. Hallelujah. Uh, so that's what the firstborn means. It doesn't mean he was the firstborn of creation, as Mormonism would say, or Jehovah's Witness. He was the firstborn in eminence, meaning in place. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. So he's our brother now. Yeah. Verse 5 again, 5b, it says, Now to him, that is to Jesus, who loves us and released us or washed us from our sins by his blood. A good comment, commentator on that would be in Romans 5, 8, 9. That would explain what he's saying here. To him who loves us and released us, washed us, cleansed us, pardoned us from our sins by his blood. Romans 5, 8 and 9. But God demonstrates his own love towards us. This is why he is set free. Not because you love him. Can I get an amen? amen. We love because what? The, the reason why we don't love is because we're not experiencing his love for yourself. He was forgiven much. Loves much. He was forgiven little. So you see, the whole love thing is based on your forgiveness. If you haven't received God's forgiveness for your life, you're not going to forgive others. But if you see that you were a wretch at first and God saved you out of his grace and mercy, you're going to be very thankful and say, thank you, Lord. 
Were there not ten lepers who were healed? Why only one came back to thank him? And that's how mankind is many times. Yeah, I'm saved, I'm washing the blood, and God's forgiven me, but do you forgive others? Because if you don't, then that tells me you don't understand what it's all about. Love is forgiveness. If you don't have forgiveness, you're lacking in love. Can I get an amen? Yeah. amen. So, he said, but God demonstrated his own love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, not good people, that Christ died for us. Now, much more than having been now justified by his blood, washed by his blood, released because of his blood from our sin. Therefore, having been justified by his blood, we have been saved from the wrath of God through him. Someone say, Amen. Amen. You don't go through the wrath. Why? We're not going to go through the tribulation. Amen. If you die tomorrow and you're saved, you're not going to see God in judgment. You're going to see him in, in, your, in his love for you and forgiveness because you've accepted him. We shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. Verse 10. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God. He's making a comparison from the worst to the better. We were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Even while we were sinners, but you accepted him. Now he says, much more having been reconciled, now that you're saved, we shall be saved by his life. What does that mean? Be saved by his life. Say, now that you're born again, don't keep Christ on the cross. He's off the cross. He resurrected, and you have his resurrection life. You will be saved by his life. The power of sin, according to Romans 6, no longer has control over you. We have to believe that. And how do you believe that? By faith, and you, and you act upon it by speaking the word of God. I know it's progressive. I know there's areas in my life that God is sanctifying as much as in you. But it says here, much more having been saved by his life. Romans 8.4 gives, gives me a little explanation of what that means, being saved by his life. Romans 8.4. I know I'm speaking fast and you can't turn to the pages, but you can write it down and you can look it up. Mm -hmm. Therefore, we have been buried with him. Remember, his death reconciled us from the wrath of God. And baptism is the uh, symbolism of it. Therefore, having been buried with him through baptism into death, so that Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so you too might walk in newness of life. We're saved by his life so that we can walk now in the power of the Holy Spirit. Some would say, Amen. Yes, Amen. You see, it's not just, you know, Catholicism or he's on the cross and we're obligated. And I know all of that is all good tradition and but if you don't have the Holy Spirit in you, you can't experience the life of Jesus Christ. Mm. The power, the freedom, the forgiveness. Say amen if you're with me. Yeah. So there's so much more that God wants to show us. And that's why I'm doing this study on the guide of the Holy Spirit. And that's why, for your information, after the service, we're going to do occasionally, I'm going to put this black uh, partition right over here. Right after service, you'll be dismissed, have your coffee and cake. But we're going to have what we call an afterglow. Those who want more of the Holy Spirit, we're going to wait on the Lord, we're going to play some music, we're going to talk a little bit. But the whole point is, he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him by faith. And that's what the Lord is showing me yes. to go to the next level with myself and with the church. So that's after service. Mm. Now, we would be saved by his life so that we too might walk in the newness of his life, his power. Hallelujah. Now, in verse 6a, he says, And he has made us to be a kingdom of priests to his God. And I'm going to talk about that. His God. Does Jesus have a God? Well, he was man too, remember. He has made us to be a kingdom priests to his God and Father. He's our Father too. To him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. So First Peter tells us, don't you know that you are a chosen generation? A royal priesthood, a holy nation that should show forth the praises of God, who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Wow. So what does it mean being that we are a priest to the Lord? Well, think about Christ. He's first. He's our high priest. And it tells us that we, since we have a high priest, we can go into the Holy of Holies now because we've been cleansed, and he calls you a priest. Or a priestess, if you want to say that. So what do priests do? Well, in the Old Testament, we know that they interceded for the nation. They brought sacrifices. When you pray for someone, 
That's your privilege to be a priest for someone, to intercede for someone. Not that you are God, but you can bring them before the high priest, Jesus Christ. Can I get an amen? Yes, and I want you to grow in that area because you have power to intercede for your family and for your friends. Just don't say, oh, it's God's will, maybe it isn't. Or, or maybe we're too lethargic about it. Listen, hell is hell. Yeah. And it's coming. And it's coming quick. And this is the time to step it up, church. Can I get yes, an amen? Right. We need to pray. I pray for my family. I don't see evidence and a whole lot of it, but I see little of it. And it's all good. It's all good. Preach the word. Teach it. Tell people about it. Yes. Divine appointments are very good. And I don't want to talk about them because I'll go on too long. But there have been divine appointments very recently in my life. And I'm sure in your life too. So you are a priest to his God. Jesus is God and Father. And we are a holy nation of peculiar people, which means his own possession. Now, when it says a priest to his God and Father... To him be the glory. And I want you to read with me or listen. In John 20, 17, Jesus said the same thing about, I now go to my God and your God. Listen. Jesus said to you, it was very clinging to him. For I have not ascended to the Father, but go to my brethren. See, if you got the same Father, he's your brother. So Jesus said, you're my brother now. You got the same Father. You used to be the father of the devil. He was your father. But when you accept the Christ, praise the Lord, Jesus has a father, and he's my father, and he's Jesus' father, but he's also Jesus' God. How's that? As the God-man. As man, he always relied on his father, who was his God. Jesus lived the life that we should have lived if Adam and Eve didn't sin. Perfect life, dependent on the father, obedient to the father. He was a man. Can you, don't forget that. He was God, but he was a man too, and he acted most of his life out dependency on the Father. I always do that which pleases him. So, Jesus said, Stop clinging to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brethren and say to them, I ascend to my Father and your Father, and to my God and your God. Yeah. Hallelujah. So, Jesus was not a created being, and he subjected himself as just a human being to God because he was created, as some religions say. Remember, he came down as God and took on the form of a human as well. It's called a hypostatic life. It's a big word, but it means 100% God, 100% man. Not 50 and 50, but 100 and 100. How do you yes. figure that out? You can't, just as much as you can not figure out the Trinity. But he said, I go now to my God and your God, my Father and, my fa and your Father, and you're my brethren. Oh, hallelujah, big brother. Verse 7, behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. So it is to be, verse 8, I am the Alpha and the Omega. That's the first letter of the Greek alphabet and the last letter, omega, of the Greek alphabet. I'm the beginning and the last, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come the Almighty. But let's think about this for a minute. Behold, he's coming on the clouds. Now, when I think of that, behold, he's coming on the clouds, you know, you, you think the clouds are either hiding him or, the or he's riding on the clouds, you know, he's surfing, whatever it may be. But in actuality, it's called the Shekinah glory. When God appeared in the cloud, his glory was there, his power. So it's just not a fluffy powder cloud that he comes and, okay, gives me evidence. But it's his glory and his power. Let me give you a scripture verse. It tells us in Exodus 40, verse 34. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting. And the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud had settled on it. And the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. So the cloud always represented the power of God and his glory. Coming out of Egypt, the cloud, they followed it. By day and by night, there was the fire. When the Father appeared uh, in his presence on the Mount of Transfiguration, it says that a bright cloud appeared and a voice came out. This is my beloved son, whom I'm well pleased. And with the cloud is his glory. It's called the Shekinah glory. The word Shekinah is not in the Bible. 
but the rabbis put together where he dwells. That's what it actually means, Shekinah, where he dwells. And so when the cloud came, it's God's power and God's glory. Hallelujah, this is good. So it says, let's dissect it. Every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. So it is to be, amen. So when does this happen? Well, Matthew 24 tells us when this happens. We'll get to that in a minute. But it says here that every eye, the world, will see him, even those who pierced him. Now he's speaking of the Jewish nation. And Zechariah chapter 12, 10 tells us this truth, that the Jewish nation will see him whom they have pierced, and they will mourn. Ah, this is him all the while. But that's when he comes for the battle of Armageddon and he destroys Antichrist and he saves Israel at last and they're going to see it's him and they're going to mourn. Now, there's also going to be others who are going to mourn because they know they missed him and they're going to go to hell. And right after that comes the the judgment of the nations when he separates the goats from the wheat, uh, the goats from the sheep. And those who are on his right will go into the millennium for the thousand years. And those on the left will go into hell with Satan into the fire that God prepared for the devil and his angels, it tells us. So that's the sequence of it. Now, Zechariah 12, 10 tells us that even those who pierced him, meaning their nation, will see him. And I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace. In the end, it tells us Romans, all of Israel will be saved. Spirit of grace and of supplication, so that they will look on me, whom they have pierced, who's me, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son, and they will weep bitterly over him like the bitter weeping over a firstborn. But those who accept Christ will mourn, and God is going to give them an opportunity of his grace. Because his grace and supplication will come upon Israel at the battle of Armageddon when he comes down with his angels and his saints Mm. and and just annihilates. The one world dictator that it's coming into, hello, socialism, it's coming, all of that, it's coming. But we look to him who's coming. I just see what's happening. I don't get consumed with it because my consummation is going to be with the King of Kings forever and ever. And I don't let the devil get me off track with just information. I want spiritual life. Can I get an amen? Amen. And that's where we're going. So, all the world, every tribe will see him, including the nation of Israel. And in Matthew 24, starting in verse 29, it gives us the sequence of it, or the chronological order of it. This is going to come after the tribulation. Notice. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, what's going to happen? The sun will be darkened. The moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky. Everything is going to unravel. And the powers of heaven will be shaken. And then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky. And then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. And they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds. What are the clouds? Glory. Of the sky with power and great glory. And he will send forth his angels with a great trumpet. And they will gather together his elect, the sheep, from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the other. So every eye in the end is going to see Jesus Christ come back. He's the King of Kings. He's the Lord of Lords. And if you belong to him, you're on the right track. You'll see him. You won't mourn and say, oh, I wish I would have made that decision because you already made the decision. I hope. Uh, yes. But there's so much more than just a decision. It's the power. It's the filling of the Holy Spirit that you want because you can't live that life every day. Jonas, he talked about you left your first love. It cooled down. Why? Because we weren't being filled with the Holy Spirit every day. He says... Be continuously filled with the Spirit. There's ways to do that. 
And if we neglect that for other things that might be good, you're going to dwindle. The fire is going to get lower. The oil is going to burn out. And this is what happens with every Christian. You've seen it. Why do people backslide? They won't call it backsliding because they don't like the word. But that's what happens if you don't refill yourself, refresh yourself, renew yourself with more of the Holy Spirit. That's why we're having this afterglow. To give all of us more of his spirit. We want more and he will reward us if we seek him diligently by faith. Someone say amen. amen. Yes, thank you. So he said in verse 8, I'm the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord. I told you that. It's the Greek alphabet, the first and the last. Verse 9, I like this. Now John is going to be speaking. He's an apostle. Powerful. Walk with the Lord. Miracles with the Lord. But he calls himself a brother. And I think that's for all of us. No matter what position you're in, whether you're a pastor or you're a teacher or you're a singer, whatever you are, this is a position God has given you. But we're brothers in the Lord. There's a relationship involved here. And so, he's saying this, John. I, John, the apostle of the Lord. No. I, John, a brother. Yeah. Check it out. And fellow partaker in the tribulation, the kingdom, the perseverance, which is in Jesus. And I was on an island of called Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. A brother. I like this. I was thinking about this. What does that mean? You ever watch some of the old movies, cowboy movies, right? Yeah. The Indian with the white man, they cut their wrist, they mix their blood. They're now blood brothers. Something deep. Who's your blood brother? Jesus. Jesus. You mingle your humanity with his blood of forgiveness. You have him. You're a blood brother of Jesus Christ. Someone say amen. amen. There's more to it than just being, hey, bro. You know, you've, you, you've heard the expression, uh, he's a brother from the hood, right? Well, what does that mean? That means he's someone who knows what the environment is about. He's part of us. He's one of us. Well, we're part of Jesus now. We're, we're the brotherhood of Jesus. We belong to him. And he belongs to us. It tells me in Hebrews 2.11, For both he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified, there's a process going on in your life, and I hope you see it, that you're changing, you're becoming more like him. And when you surrender, and that's what it's all about, it really is, we don't like that word surrender. But that's what it comes down to. And sometimes that's a painful thing. Ah, your flesh does not want to give in. Yes. Your flesh, uh, 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 I'm holding my ground. Because I know it, because I do it. But I know when the Lord is, you know, no, John, you, you want to get another one. Take another lap. You're not, you're, not, you're not finished yet, John. And then I have to swim. You're right, Lord, I don't like this pain. You know, pain is the mother of invention. Pain causes you to do things you normally wouldn't do. Amen? Yes. Are you empty? Hopefully that will push you to do something you normally don't do. Seek him more. You'll have an opportunity today. But it says here, for both he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified are all from one father, Jesus, who belong to one father, for which reason he, Jesus, is not ashamed to call you brethren. He's not ashamed. That isn't my brother. That's so I don't want to, you're not ashamed of him. Don't, don't ever put your light in, you know, well, I, you know, I got to keep the peace. Heck no. He's my father in heaven, and Jesus my savior, and he's my brother, and he's my Lord. Amen. Man, has God recently given you an opportunity to share the gospel with someone? Mm -hmm. Think about it. If not, ask, because these are the days he wants to do it. Believe me when I tell you. You just have to be willing to say, I want more of God and I want to give the gospel because it's the most important decision a man or a woman can ever make for their entire life. Amen. Eternity counts. Amen. Yes. I spoke to this guy the other day, real quick. Russian guy by the name of Yuri. Guess where I met him? Yeah. He met him to gym. <laughs> We're in the steam room. We're clothed. Don't get that image. We're clothed. We're in the steam room. And I'm starting to talk to him a little bit. 
And oh yeah, you know, socialism's coming in, you know, I'm this, that, I believe in Trump, and da, 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 da. I said, yeah, okay, okay. I said to him, uh, I'm moving in the direction of his soul, not in the direction of, you know, socialism. But that was the beginning of the conversation. So now I'm trying to bring it into, God, you want me to say something to him? So I'm just about ready to talk to him about the Lord. And all of a sudden, another big guy comes in. Hey, how you doing? And then they start talking. Hey, they're talking to each other. And he, he, he turns around and says, yeah, I know him from yesterday. He was in here yesterday. And so I had to leave. It was time for me to leave. And I said, look, boy, you, you start to plant the seed and the devil comes immediately and snatch it out. Yeah. Snatch it out. He didn't want to hear nothing about the gospel. So, you know, I take a shower. I'm, I'm dressed, dressing in the locker room. And I see him sitting down, Yuri. And I said, is that, is that Yuri? He said, yeah. I said, John, right? I said, yeah. And that was the divine appointment. Amen. I had him for 15 yes. minutes. Amen. Boom, 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 boom. And he said, you know, I was talking to someone yesterday, and you were saying the same thing that you're saying today. Amen. You just have to step out in faith. And if it's God, it'll open. If it isn't, it'll close. Yes. I thought it was closed, but he had another timing for it. And hallelujah. And I was at the point of asking him to ask Christ, but I felt, no, not yet. Don't do that, John. You, you did enough just bringing him the light of what's happening and his soul, eternity, Jesus Christ, forgiveness of sins, all of that. I didn't back off on that, but I didn't make myself look self-righteous either. But it was the truth. Without the forgiveness of sins, you're not yeah. going to heaven. Yeah. And I explained to him what heaven is. So I'm just saying that to say, be open to what the Lord wants. Oh, it, it's so invigorating. Can I get an amen? Yeah, yeah, yeah. When you know God is using you, it's like, woo! I'm on. <laughs> and that's what he wants for all of us, to be filled with the Spirit, to walk in the Spirit. And that's what that means, to walk by the Spirit. You're aware of your surroundings for his glory. Amen. So, he calls us brethren, right? Right. Now, notice the word he also says here, that we're a fellow partaker in the tribulation, the kingdom, and perseverance, which is in Jesus Christ. A partaker of his tribulation, a partaker of seeking first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you. A partaker with Jesus in perseverance. Count it all joy, brethren, when you encounter various testings, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance, right. perseverance, so that you will be perfect or mature or lacking in nothing. So we all go through the endurance thing. But Jesus did too. If you're a partaker of Jesus, you got to partake in endurance. What does that mean? That means you, 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 you suffer. Oh, God, I, you know, I've been praying and I had enough of this prayer. I can't endure it anymore. Or that person next to me, I can't endure them anymore. I'm moving on. Or that this or that. And, and we don't persevere. You miss the blessing. What does it say? With the seed that fell on the good soil. It said with an honest and good heart, along with perseverance, it bore fruit. You might have a good heart, an honest and good heart, and good soil, but you don't persevere. And so you don't bear fruit. So that's where we the cutoff comes with a lot of us at different times. Can you get an amen? Yes. If you would just hold on a little longer, and say, God, I'm yours. Live or die, I'm yours. What can I say? I'm not going to go back into the world because that's your temptation. Oh, I had it. Let me go back. I tried it. I'm going to go back to the world. I'm going to go back to my old ways. Let me lie, steal, cheat, kill, whatever it may be. You don't do that. You persevere because Jesus persevered. You're going to persevere. Yes. In tribulation, you persevere. Jesus said, in this world, you'll have tribulation, right? But take courage. I have overcome the world. So he's had men from with me. Amen. 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 <laughs> take courage. He doesn't give you the courage. He says, take it. What does that mean? Does courage mean that you have no fear? No. It's going forward in spite of the fear. A fireman goes into a burning building because he doesn't have fear? No. But he has courage that overcomes the fear. So take courage when you have fear that's trying to take your life away. Because if you live in fear, fear, it says, is torment. Listen to me. Perfect love casts out fear because fear 
involves torment. You want to be tormented? In your mind, mental torment? Then let fear start dripping in, and before you know it, it'll be a puddle, and then before you know it, you'll be overcome by fear. You, you'll have fear of the, or be, well, or fear, whatever it is, the different fear syndromes they have. Uh, and you start getting all these panic attacks, and you start getting all of this and that. Now, I'm not putting down that, but I'm telling you, it's a spiritual thing that you, that needs to erase it. Yes. Not, not medication. Medication will hold it down for a while. But it's the spiritual power of God. Remember, he says here that we are partakers of his divine nature too. Here, let me read that. That's so important. Second Peter, chapter 1, verse 4. By these, that is the promises of God. By these he has granted to us the precious and magnificent promises, so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. So what partake is not only of his suffering, but of his divine nature that gives me victory. <laughs> but I have to practice it. Be not conformed to the world, transformed by the renewing of your mind. I need to renew my mind. I need to hear the word. I need to practice it. I need to be diligent. You're hitting this, you know. It's, it's the same old story you hear me say at times. I go to the gym and I see people on the cell phones tapping. What'd you come here for? You know, I see these great outfits they have on. Is that supposed to make you strong or lose weight because you have all the paraphernalia on? And, you know, they sit there and, and I'm waiting to get on that machine and they just tap, 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 tap. Hello? Uh, when are you going to be finished? I've, co I've come to do something. You hit and miss, you know, like, come to church, you come to hear from God. Get Amen. 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 You don't want to hear me. You want to hear what the Word of God says and what the Spirit of God is speaking to your heart. And if you're open enough to believe that God does speak, you'll receive. But if you don't think He's going to speak, if you think I'm just giving you a lecture here, you'll never hear from God. But if you say to yourself, maybe God is saying something to me because He said He does speak to His vessels. So we also partake of His divine nature. I like what Paul said in Philippians 3.10, that I may know Him the power of his resurrection, yeah, we all want that. And the fellowship of his sufferings, we don't want that. <laughs> Being conformed to his death, dying to self, dying to sin. Not that I have already obtained it. Even the great Paul says, I, I'm not there yet. I'm not already become perfect, but here it is. But I press on so that I may lay hold of that which I, which also I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. Paul saying, God has a plan for me. And I'm pressing on because God has a plan for me. Now God has a plan for you. He does. I don't know what it actually is, but I do know in the Bible it tells us. We are his workmanship for good works that God has created beforehand that we should walk in them. Are you seeking the Lord? Do you sense I want more of God? I want to be more effective. Yes. I want to be more powerful in my Christian life. I want more of God. Yes. How does that happen? By faith. you got a free will. If you're happy sitting here and coming every Sunday without growing in God, that's your business. You'll take it up with the Lord in the end. But I can tell you this. You can't stay neutral. Either we're going on forward and we're pressing in, or we're dripping and going backwards. That's how it works. So I would encourage us, don't lose now. You're, you're at the one yard line. Jesus is ready to come back. Yeah. You don't want to be caught with your pants down, so to speak. You want to be caught with your boots on, fighting the good fight, living for the Lord, loving the Lord. And that's what we want. Can I get an amen? Amen. 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 So he says, I press on because God has something for me. But I like that word, press it in. So Jesus, we partake of his tribulation, but he's overcome. We partake of his kingdom because we're seeking first his kingdom and his righteousness. And we count it all joy when we go through some testings because it's producing an endurance in me. And that doesn't come easy. But hang in there. The fruit will come. Verse 10. 
I was in the spirit. I want to stay on this for a little bit. He says, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. Now, most people believe that the Lord's day is Sunday. Why? Because they broke bread on the Lord's day. And the Lord's day was the first day of his resurrection. That's when he appeared to the apostles in the upper room. That's when he appeared to Mary. So that's considered the Lord's day. The Sabbath is Saturday. The Lord's day is Sunday. So I believe that's what he's saying here. But he was in the spirit on the Lord's day. And I heard behind me a loud voice like the sound of a trumpet. So what does it mean that he was in the spirit? Was he floating around? What does it mean when it says walk by the spirit? Or pray in the spirit? There's something to being filled with the spirit. What does that mean? It means there's more to have. It means it's another level. And he was in the spirit and he heard the voice. That's how you hear from God. When you're in the spirit. So I want to just give you a little example of how the apostles and those who were in this room were ministering to the Lord. And the spirit spoke to them and said, set aside for me Paul and Barnabas. But they were in, in the spirit. The spirit spoke to them. Well, what were they doing? I'll tell you what they were probably doing. Ephesians 5.18. Do not get drunk with wine, that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms, the Word, and hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord. You get in the Spirit when you worship Him, making melody in your heart to Him. Oh God, I love you. Oh God, I want to, I just want to fall at your feet. Please, Lord, release me from myself. The spirit is a dove. He doesn't come in like a hawk. He comes in like a dove. You can grieve the spirit. You can quench the spirit. And so you wait on the Lord in ministering to him. And we went out of patience. Ah, 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 ah. Come on, I want to hear some bebop. Ah, no, give me something. No. Waiting on the Lord is a surrendering of you wanting to hear from God. And to remove the clutter in my head takes time. But when we do that, you can hear from the Lord. He was in the Spirit and he heard a voice. When you're in the Spirit, you will hear the Spirit speaking to you. So the reference that I was talking about is in Acts 13 too. Now while they were ministering to the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work for which I have called them. So if they weren't in the Spirit, they wouldn't hear it. But they were ministering to the Lord. And what does that mean? I mentioned it to you. It means... Being filled with the Spirit, worshiping, speaking to one another in Psalms. It's being conscious of wanting to hear from Him and get unconscious of all that you have planned. In 2 Corinthians 4, verse 16 says, Therefore, do not lose heart. Though the outer man is decaying, yet the inner man, that's the key word, the inner man is being renewed day by day. Is your inner man, your spirit man, your life of Christ getting renewed every day? That's why he says be continuously filled. It's a commandment. Not once a year, but be renewed every day. Lord, I need your spirit. I want you. I need you. Take time. Time is not going to make its place for you. you got to make its place for time. As someone once said, don't let the time do you, you do the time. Mm -hmm. Make plans to hear from the Lord, to humble yourself, to get more of His Spirit. Be renewed. How many of us mm. want to be refreshed? Yes. Yeah. How many of us want to be renewed? Come on, we yes. all have a renovation. I want a refreshment. I want a fresh touch from heaven. I want a, a fresh infilling of the spirit. I want freshness, not stale bread. The manner of yesterday is gone. I want the fresh bread. Can I get an amen? amen? And that's what he wants for you and for me. And that's why I'm moving in that direction. Mm -hmm. Jesus said in John 7, 37, now on the last day of the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Are you thirsty? 
He who believes in me, as the scripture says, do you believe in him? The requirement. From his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke of the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive. The Spirit wasn't given out yet, but the principle is there. If you're thirsty, come to me. And out of your innermost being, that, that, that part of you that isn't mixed up in all kinds of worldly things. Now, some things are very good. I'm not saying, you know, to be a monk. But if you want to be infilled with the Spirit, there comes a time when you have to seek Him, get humble, try to empty your mind of other things and just wait on the Lord. For they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Yes. Mount up like wings of eagles. But waiting on the Lord is something that I don't believe many of us have tried. And I know I haven't been promoting that here. But this is the time that God has shown me. John, you have to promote it. You have to show it in order for people to get a hold of it. So that's why John. The way I know God has filled me with the Spirit, and you say, no, how? And this is not bragging. I, I'm just going to bring you through the steps of how I heard from God for the first time and how I continue to hear from the Lord. And it's nothing to do with me. It's just the way I hear. You might hear from God differently. That's fine. That's beautiful. But the point is, we want to exercise that. And that's what we're going to be doing yes. for a while here. Yeah. And that's why I'm going to be doing that book, A Guide of the Holy Spirit, so that you don't think we're off the wall here. And we're doing things that are contrary to the scriptures. It's all scripture. Yeah. Now, if you're thirsty and you believe and you're saved, he's going to give you innermost water, which is his spirit. And we're closing here. He says this in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Now check this out. In verse chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus was already walking on the earth after his resurrection for 40 days. Did you know that? He was walking the earth after his resurrection for 40 days, showing himself to people and doing things. And on the 40th day, that's when he went up to the mountain and he was taken up in the cloud. And he said, wait in Jerusalem until the Spirit comes upon you. And they waited according to Acts 2, 10 days, because that was Pentecost. Pentecost falls on the 50th day. So Jesus was walking for 40 days after his resurrection. He said, now wait here until the Spirit comes upon you. And that was a big difference. He was in them. But the power of God wasn't upon them. He said, wait. And that's when we see the upper room came and the tongues of fire came and he was speaking in other languages. And that's a story I can't go into now, but this is all we're going to talk about in the days ahead. And so they waited and it says that they, they were in a room praying. Let me, let me read that to you. Well, I didn't write that down. But in Acts chapter 2, I believe it is, in the beginning verses, it says that Jesus' mother, along with the others, were in the room, in the upper room, praying. And that's when the Holy Spirit came upon them all, even Jesus' mother. So when people say Jesus' mother was, you know, she intercedes for you. No, she, she received the Holy Spirit upon her too. So it just wasn't, you know, 10 of them. It was over 120. The good news is this. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in Judea, Samaria, and even to the remotest parts of the world. He says in Jude 120, but you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. <coughs> we'll talk about that later. But Jesus, but God said this, pursue love, but earnestly desire the spiritual gifts, especially that you want to prophesy. So that's the gifts. I don't want to go into that because it's too long right now. But there's more to have in the gifts of the Spirit, in the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, so that you will be bold and be a witness for God. But he said, if I have not love, it doesn't matter what I have. You can have the greatest gift of faith to move mountains. You can give your body to be burned. You can speak with tongues of angels. But if you have not love, he says it's empty. So, love is the essence of why we seek God. 
and why we seek more of God. That is to be witnesses to the world, to be, be more powerful in our prayer life, to be more powerful for one another and serve one another by the power of the Spirit. But if we're not getting renewed, we're going to dry up. So today is the day. And what I do, I'm going to say to the worship team, come on up. And as soon as it closes, 10 minutes later, I'm going to put this black partition against there. And if you want to come in, come in before I put that up. Because once I put it up, I don't want people walking in and disrupting because we're waiting on the Lord. It's a, it's a sacred time. And interruptions <coughs> makes people start looking around. What's going on? Oh, he noises. Am I right or wrong? It takes a consecration and concentration. So if you want to stay and have coffee, that's fine. That's, that's, your, that's your privilege. But if you say, I want more of God, uh, you stay here or come back within 10 minutes when we close. And we'll have that part And we're going to wait on the Lord. I, I have a few thoughts I want to say, a few songs. And we're just going to humble ourselves and wait on the Lord, not twiddling our thumbs. But you'll see, we're going to be seeking the Lord, and the Lord will speak. And if you want more of the Spirit of God, this is the beginning steps. If you've never accepted Christ, I want to always make that the most important timing at the end. Because if you don't believe in Jesus, you're going to go to hell. Bottom line, I don't want to see you go there. But if you believe Jesus is the Son of God and He died on the cross for your sins, and you do, ask Him into your heart and say, Jesus, forgive me, I'm a sinner. And He takes no, He 